So during this month of January, we're going to be studying chapter 4 of Ephesians. Every Sunday, a little bit of chapter 4 of Ephesians. So if you have your Bibles, as we just uh, saw on the, the video, if you have your Bibles, open it. In the book of Ephesians, it's a letter written by Paul the Apostle, probably around the year 62 or 63, not 1963, 0063. Uh, in, in the book of Acts, chapter 19, you see Paul's journey to Asia Minor, and then he arrives in Ephesus, uh, in the present day Turkey. So he arrives in, in Ephesus, and he remains in Ephesus roughly a little over two years, teaching about Jesus in a very important area uh, that could, uh, because of the port and the business, everything, the, the gospel could go and be spread as it did throughout Asia during that time. So then a few years later, probably ten years later, Paul is in Rome in prison, and from prison, he receives a visit from Tychicus. One of his friends comes from uh, Ephesus and, and Colossae, and, and he visits Paul in prison, and Paul writes this beautiful letter alongside with Colossians, and he sends this letter to the church in Ephesus, roughly the year 62, so he's in prison. And basically, the letter is divided into two big groups. Chapter 4, verse 1, that we're going to study, begins with a Greek word that would be therefore. Therefore. With this in mind, with this in mind, do this. Verse chapter 1 to chapter 3, Paul is emphasizing everything that God has done through his son Jesus Christ. He talks about the gospel. The good news, gospel is good news. He says, you were dead, in chapter 2 he says, that you were dead in your sins, there's no relationship between you and God anymore, impossible. There is nothing you could do to have a relationship restored with the creator who created you and loves you, but you, you couldn't, you're dead. And there's no fellowship, no way possible that someone dead could approach a living God. So he says that everything was broken. And in Christ, through Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection of the cross, he brought everybody back to him. Everyone who believed, he says, he brought to him. And then he will emphasize one word in this first three chapters of Ephesians. He will say, in Christ, God is creating a new humanity. A new mankind. The same as he did in, in, in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. And he created mankind. He created us. And because of sin, sin brought death. And then everything fell into uh, death. No more fellowship with the Creator. And so we see everything broken as we see today, even today. This was his creation. So his merciful plan was to create again. But this new time without the possibility of sin. So he created. We went away from him because of our sin. And in Jesus Christ, through the cross... He brought us back. And he said, now in Christ, he is the head of this new body that I'm creating. I'm creating a new humanity in my son, Jesus Christ. So the first three <clears throat> chapters of the, the book of Ephesians will say that Paul is praising God for his faithfulness, for his forgiveness, for his grace, the way he brought us back to him. This is the gospel story. This is the story of Jesus and how God loved us through his son. Chapter 4, 5, and 6 are our 
God's gospel stories. How we respond to His amazing love. How you and I react to His love. I keep saying over and over again, every time someone comes to you and says, I love you, you could not respond, thank you very much. This is not the way of doing it. Right? How do you respond to the fact that you were dead, away from God, hopeless, lost, and then He in His grace and mercy, His free will, His power, He decided to visit you in your death and bring you back to Himself and offer you eternal life. Eternal life. This beautiful Greek word, zoe, that begins now and will never end. When I was a young boy, and I grew up in church, every time the pastor, my dad, would say, uh, eternal life, I would say, you know what? One day when I die, eternal life will begin. And then I had to learn this beautiful zoe word, Greek. They say, no, eternal life begins the very moment when the Holy Spirit, sent by God, because of my faith in Jesus Christ, enters me and seals me, and marks me, and say, I belong to Him. And then this new life will begin to pump inside of me, pump inside of me, and slowly, day by day, day by day, day by day, I begin to experience this divine quality of life. And will grow and grow and increase, 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 and even when my body, my physical body is gone, I, Jaime, not a spirit that represents me, me, myself, and I. I, Jaime, will live forever, fully, fully, the same. The Bible says, the Bible emphasizes over and over, the same way as Jesus Christ is today, the very perfect human that He is. This is how every single believer will be one day. This is why we have to be patient with one another. He who began the work in us Hasn't done it yet. It's adjusting a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And I hope, even, even I, I'm 53 and I say this. I was talking to Louisa this week. We were like transitioning from 2019 to 2020. And I say, wow, you know what? One more year God gave us, right? So beautiful, so gracious from Him to do that. And sometimes I look back to my life and I say, wow, I'm so ashamed of some of the things I lived when, when I was, I don't know, 15, 20, 30, 52. And, uh, and now I, 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 I grew a little bit, I can tell, like just, just a little bit. Until one day, plenty, no more mistakes, errors, no more. Free, absolutely free. I will enjoy His presence. I will enjoy fully life. So, how do we live our own gospel story? How do you respond to the cross? This is what we're going to see these four Sundays, beginning today. And the first one I'm going to talk to you is about unity. And for us to understand unity, and we could talk about unity, it's how important it is, you know, the, the more united we are, the stronger we're going to be, and those kind of things. We could use those kind of arguments to say we must be united. We must be united, right? But I want to have a different approach. I want to say why we must be united. Why we must be united. Uh, Two days ago, and uh, even today, I think, if you go to the papers and uh, internet, you're going to see that one big denomination in the U.S., there are about 15 million people. 15 million people. And uh, this is open in every single newspaper uh, here now. It's United Methodist Church. Uh, historically, a great church. And now they are divided. They are divided. Since uh, two years ago, they had a, a major vote whether or not to have uh, uh, how to approach the LGBT community. And then the church divided exactly in half. And I, I was reading about it, 
uh, Fox News two days ago, and it was written like this. The church is split. There's a division. There's a split in the church. This was, this was how it, it, they, they framed the, the phrase for us. The church is split. And this is, this is something impossible. It's a mox, mox moron. Oops. Ox. I know the word. I just want to know if you know. Oxmoron. This is an impossibility. According to Paul, it's an impossibility to divide the church. How can you? You can. I'm horrible with numbers. I, I, I know nothing. Just to begin to say it, I begin to sweat. I'm horrible with numbers. But I know you can divide two. Right? One and one. Two. Easy. But you can't divide it One. You just can't divide one. And this is the great thing about this uh, message in, in, in the book of Eph 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 Ephesus. How can we divide? And I want to talk to you about this. And first of all, for us to understand this, we have to understand uh, what God has done to us. And then I have some verses for you. The first one in Ephesians 1, 4, and 5, this is what Paul says. For he, God, chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestinated us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. This is a plan. This is what God has done to us. And he has adopted us to be their, his children again through Jesus Christ. The only way you can be God's children, daughter or son, is through Jesus Christ. And God has done this. It's done. Period. The cross. Right? This is what he's done. Uh, verse 7 and 8, he says, In him we have redemption through his blood. In Jesus we have redemption. Redemption is you were a slave, you were there to be sold, and he redeemed you. The beautiful Greek word, ex agora, he took you out of the, the, the square where we, we sell slaves. He went there, he was not ashamed of doing it, he went there and he said, I want to buy Jaime. Jaime is a sinner, he's dead, I want to buy him out of the, 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 that place. And this is what, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us abundantly. He not only forgave me, but he forgave me abundantly, abundantly. Just say, I'll forgive you. This is what he's saying. In the verses 13 and 14, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. There's a mark. Everyone who, as Paul says to the Romans, in his heart he believed in Jesus, and with his mouth he confessed that Jesus is his Savior and Lord. Everyone who does is saved, the Bible says. And then the Holy Spirit comes and He dwells in you. He lives in you. There's a seal. There's a guarantee. There's, there's a stamp saying, oh, this, is, this belongs to God. So He says, this, He has done that. We have the Holy Spirit. Also, chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive. Chapter 2 begins, you were dead. You were dead. What a sentence. He's not desiring you to be dead. He's stating it, the obvious. He says, you are dead. But because of his great mercy, only out of mercy, nothing that we could deserve, I never deserved to be brought back to life. Out of his mercy, he made me alive again. I'm alive. I'm alive. Sometimes I, I show a little bit of signs of the dead man inside of me. I struggle sometimes. But then there's the, the, the one that is alive, that comes and says, I'm still alive. Yeah, two days ago I saw on, on, on CTV news, this uh, farmer, I believe, was somewhere in Saskatchewan. 
and he saw this uh, deer bucks, two deer bucks. They, they were fighting, and with their antlers, they, uh, I don't know, they were stuck together for many days, for many days, two big deer buck, just like that. And they're fighting, and the antlers hooked up somehow there, and they were just there. And during this many days that they were there, one of them was killed by coyotes. Just some coyotes. They came and killed one of them and ate half of them, half of him, the, the other one. So you, if you go to CTV, you see the, 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 the frame. You see this live buck, and he, whenever he, he goes here and there, and he brings with him this dead deer with him. Dragging him everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. So they called a police officer. And somehow he helped the two of them to get free from one another. And one went free. This is somehow how I see us. There's the new Jaime who's alive in Christ. But I still the, the old Jaime, dead Jaime that is here with me. And every time, here and then, I struggle and I drag the old Jaime with me. But I'm alive now. And one day, totally, I'll be uh, free from the dead one. The day will come. The day will come. And until then, I have to keep my eye on Jesus. Um, verse 8 in chapter 2. God has done it. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. You can buy it. There's nothing you could do to deserve it. Whether you're you're a man or a woman, if you're poor or rich, if you live in Canada, if you live in Africa, anywhere, it doesn't matter. Nothing. You just don't deserve it. By grace, he gave it. The only thing is you have to, to believe it. You have to have faith in this. So then the next one, uh, verse 10, in chapter 2, God has done it. He gave us the possibility, a purpose, for we are God's handwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. He has given us a purpose. He said, now there's something for you to live. I want you to live this kind of life. Verse 13, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near. We are so far from God, so far from God. Because of Jesus, now we are very close to him. This is why Isaiah says, God is not far. Isaiah, the prophet, God is not far. He's very near, very near. You just have to whisper. Sometimes not even with her words, just your heart. You have to say, God, I need you. He's very there, right there, near you. This is what he, Paul is saying. So he has done it. Verse 15, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity. Not only he's creating a new Jaime. It's beautiful it's the way C.S. Lewis says in, in, the, in the Narnia uh, series. When this girl, she, she wants to drink water, and, and she's thirsty, and she approaches the fountain, and she sees a big lion, Aslan, and Aslan is, is near the, the fountain, and she says, can I come to drink water? And Aslan says, yes, you may. Do you harm, do you hurt little girls? And he says... No, I don't harm you. I kill you. This is what is the new birth. God doesn't want to fix you. He wants to create a new you. But you must die with him to be born again, a new you. New you. I think it was Dostoyevsk in Russia who said, when I got to know Jesus, all everything that was on my right came to my left. Everything from my left came to my right. I became a new man, new values, new way of seeing life, everything, new way of loving, new way, everything was new. But not only he's creating a new Jaime, but in Christ, he's creating a new humanity, a new mankind. Everyone will be one body, just one big family 
And Jesus Christ will be the head of this new family. This is what Paul is saying. A new humanity. Verse 19. We were no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of His family. Paul is saying now, all of us, you're not just a visitor. You know when you receive someone, you welcome someone visiting you and you say, oh, stay in my house and I provide a, a room and bed for you. No, you are now part of my family. You live here. This is, this is your house and I am your father. This is what he's saying. I am your father. All of us, we have one father and all of us live in the same family, in the same household. Chapter 3, verse 6. Paul says, through the gospel, the good news, the Gentiles, who are the Gentiles? Everyone who were not like Paul. Paul was Jew. And then we have to understand, and I won't take a lot to do this, maybe another day, but the gospel came through the Jews. Through the Jews, the gospel came. Jesus himself, he was from the line of David and Abraham. He was a Jew, and through him, God promised to, through Abraham and, and Abraham, and Paul explained this, this. He says, through Abraham, Jesus was born roughly 1,700 years later, and then Jesus became our Savior. And now, he says, we are his children. And then he says, we're no longer foreigners. We're no Gentiles, a different part of the world. He says, no, there's no more division between Jews and Gentiles. The world now is divided into those who belong to Jesus and those who don't. This is what Paul is saying. Chapter 3, verse 6, verse 12. In Him, and through faith in Him, we may approach God in Jesus. We have confidence, freedom to just come. To him. Imagine that you could never come to God in any way. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, the author of Hebrews says that now, because of Jesus, his blood has opened a new and living way in which we can walk through his blood. There's a new path that I can come to the throne of God. I don't have to fear it anymore. There's no reason for me to fear every time I can come. And the Bible says this throne, the name of it is throne of grace. I, I can't imagine a, a more beautiful name for God to sit in a throne. Throne of grace. Every single time, little Jaime has to walk, doesn't have to fear, but has to walk with confidence and comes and come. Come, come. Grace. Every time. This is powerful, what Paul is saying. Very powerful, what he's saying. This is what God has done. Still in chapter 3, Paul talks about things that God still wants to do. And this is verses 8 and 10. He says, My task as an apostle... So it is ours as a church. This is his task as an apostle. This is ours as a church. My task is to bring out in the open and make plain what God, who created all this in the first place, has been doing in secret and behind the scenes all along. Through followers of Jesus, like yourselves, gathering churches, this extraordinary plan of God is becoming known and talked about even among the angels. Even the angels, they are talking. Did you see what God is doing through the church? Did you see what God is doing through the apostles? Has done through the apostles, now doing through the church. Did you see it? Even the angels are talking. How come God so powerfully choose a group of people like us, imperfect like us, so different like we are, and say, through you, my plan will come to fulfillment. Everything that I have done spiritually, it will come to fulfillment through the church. Verse 14, Paul says, For this reason, for this reason that everything that I told you that what God has done and what now God wants to do through you, 
He paid all the price. He went to the cross. He brought us back to life. He paid the price. And He wants to have an entire world, every single one of us, His creation, the entire world. He wants to bring us to be one big family in His Son, through His Son. And He will do this through the mission of a church. Of that church. And for this reason, Paul says, I pray. Paul is in prison. I just mentioned now, a few moments ago, Jesus was a few hours before being crucified and his prayer was that we would become one. This is Paul in prison probably a year, year and a half, maybe two years later, he was killed, beheaded. And his prayer was not that we would want the lottery or have a new car. His prayer for us is that I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you he wants us to be strong, as strong as possible for this mission. I pray that we will strengthen you so much so, verses 16 and 19. I pray out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So Paul says he will strengthen you and Jesus will be so alive inside of you. Christ will be there, and He will reign in your hearts. He will be there, not just sleeping there as a, as, a, as a guest. He will be alive inside of you, He says. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, rooted, established, what is the firm foundation for us to do anything, to make any decision? Love may have power together with all Lord's holy people to grasp, just grasp, trying to understand, grasp, trying to understand how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ. And to know his, this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So his prayer for us is this. Do you see, do you understand what God has just done out of love? In chapter 2 he said, because of his great love that he loved you, he brought you back to life. Do you understand this? Do you realize what God has done actually on the cross? Do you ever stop and think and say and meditate and say, wow, the cross actually existed and this was his plan to save us? I keep saying over and over again, if Jesus had to die on the cross in order for me to be saved, imagine how huge and how horrible was my sin. My situation was desperate. Because if, if my situation was not desperate, probably God would have maybe fixed a different way, a different solution for me to be saved. But He had to be drastic. He had to kill His own Son. And his own son had to be cursed. All the curse that was upon my life came upon Jesus. This is what Isaiah says. Isaiah says, because of my sin, Jesus became ugly in the presence of God. My sin actually made him ugly. It's a deformation. It's a spiritual wording. Just to say how horrible and desperate my situation was. Do you understand this, Paul is saying? And I pray that you will have power so to grasp a little bit of everything that is going on. Are you aware of what's going on? Are you understanding what God has done? Because if you understand what He has done, probably your attitude will be different. If you understand how, how high and long and deep and, and wide is His love, He stretched out Himself all over, all over, all over, everything, every little, little inch that He could, He stretched Himself just to love me. And Paul is saying, I pray that you understand that because I want once you understand what God has done for you on the cross and what God wants to do through the world, to the world to your neighbor, 
to someone in your house, what God wants to do, you will have a different attitude. You cannot ever just have this beautiful God coming to you and say, I love you this wide. I love you this deep. I love you this high. I love you this long. And you just say, okay, thank you. And somehow this is how we respond to him. Somehow this is how we're just so negligent. God is here showing, Paul says, lavishing his love, pouring abundantly his love on us day and day and night and night and everything on the cross, displaying his, in Romans chapter 5, God has proved once for all that he loved us when Christ died for us. And then I say, okay, thank you very much, God. You're so nice. What a cool God you are. You loved me. Oh, you're nice. You were right there in my list of people that I think are cool. This is not how we respond to it. Paul says, my only prayer for you is that you will have your eyes open. And then you say, wow. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Paul says, 14, 15, 17, Paul says, you know what? The love of Christ constrains me. The love of Christ constrains me. I feel almost embarrassed when I understand what God has done for me. I said, what? He has done this for me? I have no other option. I've told this before. The Greek words say God constrains me with His love. It's it's almost something, there's no other answer that I can give Him. There's no other way that I, I can be just... Just there observing and saying, oh, God is good. No. There's something different. And this is why chapter 4, verse 1 comes. And Paul says, I'm trying as much as I can to explain to you how big and wide and profound His love is. Therefore, therefore, How are you answering it? What's your answer to God's love? If we... I think think Jesus is so irresistible that if we understand what He has done for us at the cross, there's no way I could just be there and say, oh, thank you very much. If I have the Holy Spirit opening my eyes, I say, wow, my destiny was eternal death. But He saved me from that. There was a huge price that He paid for me. There's something I have to do about it. There's something I have to do about it. There's a reaction. And Paul says, as a prisoner for the Lord. But there's a debate in the original here. If he's saying, because of the Lord. Because he was in prison for sure. But he also could have been saying here, I am his prisoner. I have no other option. I'm tied up with Jesus. I'm prisoned in him. This is it. Because of Him in me, I urge you, I exhort you, I beg you, I wish I were there right now, I was there right now, could grab you by your shoulders and say, wake up! See, I'm in prison because of Jesus and I'm rejoicing for it. I want you to be rejoicing as well. I want you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Twice he used the word kaleo, which is the word ecclesia in Greek, church. You were called to be church. You were called, so be it. Now that you know how much he loved you, come on, go there and live a life that is worthy of what He has done for you. This is what Paul is saying. And then, 
he will say two things for us briefly, and I'll finish. First one, unity requires the appropriate attitude of someone who understood what God has done and what he still wants to do. Paul says, I'm in prison, and I want you, I urge you to live a good life for Jesus, worthy of the cross, worthy of everything he has done for you. I want you to live this kind of life, and it begins with unity, he says. He gives us an example right away. Right there, he says, unity is the number one thing that I want from you. So that you can tell me as I am in prison here, you be united. You be united. And he says, be completely humble and gentle. Humble, of course. We are so different. We have so many differences and preferences. And the opposite of being humble is being proud. And pride as C.S. Lewis says, is the mother of all sins. And because of pride, we have divisions. We have preferences. It's my way, my way, my way, or highway. It's either you do it my way, or I'm out of here. But he says, be humble. Be very, very, very humble. Absolutely humble. And gentle. Beautiful Greek word, gentle. Gentle, actually, it means to be tamed by the king. Jesus is so alive inside of you. It's the same word as he used in Matthew chapter 11 when Jesus says, come and learn, learn with me. I'm meek. Remember? I'm meek. I'm gentle. This is the same word. Someone comes. It's the Holy Spirit. He tames me. There's a wild beast inside of me. Remember the two deer fighting one another? The Holy Spirit comes, and this is His power to tame me, to domesticate me. I remember many years ago, Louisa and I, we went to visit a professor of us, in, uh, a professor, professor of ours, and, and, uh, and we opened the door of his house because we had the freedom to do it, and we opened the door, and, uh, and Mr. Behrens, he was... Uh, folding the, the clothes from, from the dryer, right? He was washing the clothes and then folding them. And we opened the door, and he was this, this, this man that we respect, a PhD, a, a, a great guy, a missionary, and gray hair, and this long beard, and beautiful man, very... And he was there, and we opened the door, and he said... <gasps> his, we saw him, we caught him, like, folding all the... All the whatever... And then and he said, oh, are you scared to know how domesticated I am by my wife? Are you surprised that the Holy Spirit wants to domesticate you? And, and then his power will flow through you. It's only when you surrender to him, he will be strong in you. As long as you are strong, as long as you are powerful, there's no need for the Holy Spirit to be powerful in you. Go ahead and do it yourself. But as you surrender, he says, I'll do it. Bearing with one another. It's quite interesting. He says, bearing. Bearing is it's, it's not a positive word. Do you understand this? Supporting one another is not very positive. I support you. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's not something like, oh, I have great joy to be with you. I rejoice because you're my friend. Oh, you're, you're so fantastic. Actually, Paul is saying, well, I have to bear with you. I have to support you. And he says, do it. Remember what God is doing. He's bringing everyone together. He wants to bring everyone together. He says, make every effort. This is the stress in the entire chapter. 
make every effort, he says, make every effort, make every effort, every single one of them. Try it and try it again and try it again and try it again, try it again to keep unity in the body. Church, one body, keep united. Do everything you can. Maybe someone is talking something, say stop. Oh, the pastor didn't went to visit me in my home. He didn't come to visit me in my home. Stop! Oh, so and so, did you see it? Stop! Oh, did no, stop! We have to learn to make every single effort to live in unity. We have to stop spreading everything that will destroy the unity. We have to be intentional. We have to do and say things that will actually build up the body, not destroy the body, he says. The Spirit through the bond of peace, this is what he wants. So what Paul is saying, the number one is, as long as you understand what God has done and he still wants to do, make every single effort to be one. It's something that depends on us. Do you know why? We have a split over split over split, whether here or whether in the United Methodist Church in the U.S., 15 million people divided, because maybe we never do all the necessary effort that the Bible requires from us. We're very good at blaming, but we have to say, I have to do it better. Because the cross demands it from me. Number two. Unity requires the understanding of the obvious. Paul says, there's one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope, when you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. I think the next slide will represent this better. One body. One spirit. One hope. One Lord. One faith. One baptism. One God the Father. So why do we insist in adding my way into it? Because he did everything he did to form a new body for himself. One. God the Father, who is the Father of this body. The Holy Spirit, just one. And the Son, who actually is the aim of our faith. And because of him we are baptized. We offer ourselves in baptism just to, to say that we are just one, although we are different. The purpose of the entire letter of Ephesians is chapter 1, verse 10. And he says that his purpose in Christ is to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head. Christ. I'll say that again. The end of verse 9. His purpose in Christ. God's purpose. Why he did everything he did. Why the cross. Why everything that God has done. Why his purpose. His intention. His goal. What he aims out of it. Is to bring all things in heaven. And on earth. Together under one head. Christ. The church must understand that. And the church must respond to that with the right attitude saying, Father, if this is what you want from me, this is what I'm going to do. We, although we are part of this universal church, we are part of the same church 2,000 years ago and the church in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, in South America, in Central America, everywhere. We are just one church. But I believe Paul is saying that this begins 
in the very local church where we are church. Sometimes it's very easier or much easier for us to say, oh, I'm one with the church in Africa. Of course, I don't live there. I'm not there every day to see all the problems every single day. So if you want to see the universal thing happen, you have to begin here in our little church. Say, yes, we are one. We struggle. We are different. Sometimes, yes, we have preferences. But we're going to do every single thing possible to maintain and to build up unity. Because this is why Jesus died on the cross. And through this unity, remember what we just read as we had communion. Through this unity, Calgary, your neighbor, your family will understand that he is the Savior and that they need to be saved. Next Sunday, we'll continue this. Let's pray. Would you stand with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day and the opportunity we have to be here together as a family that we are. And you are our Father. And here we are together to celebrate your love to us. It was demonstrated through your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for loving us in a way that you saved us in a time that we couldn't be saved by ourselves. You had to do it, and you did it. And here we are today, offering ourselves. Father, we know that we don't love you back the way you, you deserve. We, we don't love you back the way we should. We are so limited, but we want to love you more. And we want to respond with the right attitude. So I pray that your Holy Spirit will visit us, even this new year, and will visit us, and will reveal to us, and show to us how long, and how deep, and how wide, and how high is your love for us. And this discovery of such an amazing love will constrain us in such a way that we're going to have no other option but to love you back powerfully, beginning with the unity among ourselves. Help us truly to be one with one another here and with your entire church, wherever they are. And I pray, Father, that your, your, your name will be glorified in us and through us, and many more will join your church, the body of your Son, Jesus, in which He is the head. Give us the honor, Father, to be this church, this united church that loves you and that serves you in a way that your name is honored, that our life is worthy of the cross, that you may go ahead of us as the one who guides us, that you may go above us as the one who governs our lives. That you may go beside us as our companion of every day. We're never alone. That you may go behind us keeping us safe. That you may go underneath us as the firm rock where we stand in all the troubles and conflicts of our lives. But we're firm on the rock. You may go inside of us, giving us this new life, making of us this new humanity, giving us through your Holy Spirit the understanding of your love. Because I'm sure As soon as we understand fully your love, we will respond in a manner that is worthy of your name. Amen.